Good evening. Welcome to Emmanuel. Uh, just let me extend my welcome to you as well. Uh, particularly if you are a new or you are a guest. My name's Stephen. Thanks so much for joining us. Maybe you were around during our Christmas services through December and have come back to check us out during our new Thrive series. Uh, I don't know how you're feeling about 2019, uh, but as a church, uh, we want to encourage you that God wants you to thrive. Not just merely survive, we're just going to get through, but there's something in God that each of us can grab and enjoy him and really go for it uh, this year. So spending the first four weeks looking at what it means to thrive in different areas of our life. And so if you weren't around last week, uh, Joel started off by looking at what it means to thrive in terms of our time and uh, what we do with it. Knowing that lots of us have pressures on us in terms of things that we ought to do, things that we think we should do or what other people think we should do. But really looking at what is it that we must do? What is it God has got prepared for us that we can move in and go for uh, this coming year? Let me encourage you to go back and listen to that if you've not listened to it already. But this morning, this evening, uh, we are going to be looking at money and uh, looking at how we can thrive in that way. But when it comes to the, 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 the kind of issue of money, for some people in the room, maybe many of us in the room, it's not maybe the most exciting subject. You're thinking there are pressures that you personally have when it comes to finance. I know that would be true for myself. But the reality is, uh, even in society around us, money and the issue of finance is a difficult one uh, in these days. Uh, since the crash, the financial crash in 2008, we can no longer expect what the generation expected beforehand, which is basically think, oh, then each generation will get a bit more affluent, a bit more rich, a bit more comfortable. That's how, that's the trajectory things were on. And the 2008 crash, financial crash, just put an end to that, put a stop to that. So we no longer expect that. Although we are relatively very, very well off compared to the rest of the world, within our society, we are feeling financial pressures like we've not felt before. Let me give you some stats. This is from the website, themoneycharity.org. It says this. In real terms, the average employee is now 4.8% worse off than in 2008. So although your wage might have risen in some terms, in real terms, because of the, the, the rise of living cost, most of us are 4.8% worse off. Average debt per household has risen to 60 grand, 60,000 pounds, including mortgages, but our average household is 60 grand in debt. And these are some stats from last year. Last year, every five minutes and 16 seconds, someone was declared bankrupt or insolvent. Last year, Citizens Advice Bureau dealt with 2,460 debt issues every single day. Last year, a house was repossessed every two hours. As well as that, 902 people were made redundant every day as well. There's some pretty stark figures there. And they're not just figures that are out there Think, oh, that's, that's not great for our nation. That's figures that exist in here. That's things that me and you, people that we love and care for, have had to deal with in this last year. Reality of uh, kind of personal difficulty when it comes to finances, of mounting credit card bills. Maybe you've got a credit card right now, you've maxed out. Maybe onto a second one, maybe your credit card's up, moving around balances from one card to another, trying to get the best uh, deal, just trying to keep afloat. Maybe you're in your overdraft in a crazy way. Maybe you're just watching your student loan mount up thinking, I mean, are you ever going to get a job that's really ever going to pay it back and get yourself in a good place? Maybe you're one of those people who's faced redundancy this year. As well as all that, we live in a crazy expensive city. It's a cool city, but a coffee is what, 23, 24 pounds now. You know, it's crazy here. Life is expensive. We all are under financial pressures. Think, how can we thrive in the midst of all this? Maybe just think, I just want to try and get through this year. What would the world say to us as we face these kind of difficulties? Maybe they'd say one of these things. Maybe they'd say, hey, don't worry about it. It'll get better. Just get some retail therapy. Just buy something else. Put it on the credit card. Hopefully at some point you'll win the lottery or you'll inherit some money or at some point you'll get your dream job. But don't worry about it right now. Just put it to the back of your mind. Just tuck those paper bills under your bed and forget about it. Or maybe it's a sense of, okay, if things are bad, then I need to try harder and work harder. I need to go for it. I need to trim back where I can and uh, go after uh, money with all my heart. That's what some people do. Say, okay, well, if it's difficulty, then I need to get myself a nice nest egg 
I need to find some material comfort at any and all cost. Relational cost, health cost, just the piece of your own heart cost. That's what people do. They become workaholics, not just because they love their work, or that might be the case, but because there's a drive to make sure you're financially secure and comfortable. But I want to encourage you that neither of those ways or any way that doesn't involve God is the right way. And the Bible speaks again to the, the foolishness of that. Financial difficulty eventually will catch up with you. Or even if you manage to somehow get yourself a nest egg that feels secure, let's be fair, that's a lot of people felt very secure in 2008 when the credit crunch hit. Crunch hit. So people were left without a penny. But even if you are secure, are you secure in your heart if you're having to live that kind of lifestyle where you're enslaved to the pursuit of money? The good news this evening is the Bible says there's a better way. There's no way not just to hide away, not just to survive, but to genuinely thrive in the place of knowing God. Now, as we walk with him through life, we can know his gracious provision in a way that saves us from greed, saves us from anxiety. Instead, it gives us a sense of peace, of godly ambition and generosity. Last week, we were talking about what are the must you should do? What are some of the things that God wants you to pursue? We want to be ambitious people. Those who follow Jesus should be ambitious for great things. Well, that often takes great resource as well. But you know what? We've got the Lord Almighty with us who loves to resource his people to do the things that they are, want to do for him. So our aim this evening is really to get our heads lifted. I don't want us to get our heads down about finance, but really to get our heads lifted up to know that when, the, when money gets mentioned, it's not a reason to inwardly groan or to shudder, but where our response could be joy and trust of generosity, of freedom and praise to God as well. And to do that, we're going to look at one of the Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 112. So if you've got an electronic device or a Bible with you, why don't you turn there and we'll have a look at this together. Look at some principles that are going to help us as we choose to thrive or, or seek to thrive with God this year. Here it is. So Psalm 112, I'll read the whole thing to you. It says this, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful and righteous. It is well with a man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice, for the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honour. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Let me pray for us and then we'll have a look at this. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your words in the Bible. Thank you it's not some vague philosophy or just some good advice. Thank you it's your words from your mouth to us. That we can hear and take it on board, turn over in our hearts and minds, Lord, that it might do us good. I pray as we meditate upon it over these next kind of uh, short while, Lord God, that it might do us good. It might transform how we see you. It might transform how we view ourselves, how we view finance, Lord God, that we might uh, get a right perspective, that we might use finance for your glory, for our benefit and for being generous to others as well, Lord God. I pray when you speak to the, the person who's feeling like this subject is most poignant for them, Lord, but also for the person who feels most secure. Thank you that right across the spectrum, there's things for you to say to us this evening. I pray, give us ears to hear you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So when we're looking at this uh, passage together, and uh, it's ultimately a, a, it's a poem, a song to God, about expresses something of who he is. Now there's, in it, there's lots of things to be said to us. It kind of paints a picture of a fictional person who trusts God and the, and the ways that they deal with finance. So we're going to look at their life. We're going to look at some principles, about five principles from their life, and how it's going to help us thrive with money. But ultimately, it's about God. And that's about God. And so there's five headings, all beginning with the letter P. You're welcome. And the first one is the person who thrives is one who has perspective. The one who has perspective. It says here in the first verse, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. 
Fearing God is the first place to start when it comes to all of life, including time and money and some other things we'll look over the next couple of weeks. But our first place that we need to start as Christians is with God. Knowing that ultimately he needs to be in the right place. It's all good to talk about money. And hopefully, if you, even if you don't know God tonight, there'll be some bits of wisdom that you can pick on that are going to help you. But ultimately, the, for the picture to really work and hang together, we need God right at the centre of it. And it talks here about not just being the centre, but us about fearing him, having a perspective about who he is, having an awareness of his sight, his scale, the largeness of who he is, the might in which he has, the infinite wisdom and uh, power that belongs to him. He is creator God. He is our sustainer. He's the one who gives every good gift that we have. We need to have that perspective. So often it can be, oh, God's just over there. He's a part of life. No, no, he is all of life. And we need to treat him like that. I was talking to Simon, our worship pastor this afternoon, about fearing God. And he compared it to standing at the bottom of the Hoover Dam. As you look back up, there's genuine awe. Now we use the word awesome for all kinds of things, but genuine awe, looking up thinking, wow, that wall is holding back a massive weight of water that we can't really ever really imagine. That could come crushing down. There's genuine kind of fear and awe and respect. We need to have that kind of sense when it comes to God and some. This God is worthy of our attention. He is worthy of our respect, worthy of our awe and fear. Much more than the national debt, much more than our personal circumstances, much more than any other person. No, we are to fear God and get that perspective right. It says this in Proverbs 1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We need knowledge when it comes to the issue of finance, how to use it, how to steward it. And the beginning of knowledge starts with, with fearing God, getting him right in your life. And maybe you don't know God tonight. You want, I want you to know here at Emmanuel, our first prayer for you, the first thing I want to say to you is get to know God. God cares about what you do with money. I care what you do with your money, but I care far more about what you do with him and what you do in terms of your knowledge about him. Investigate him, understand him first. And the man in our psalm, our person in our psalm today, he understands this. He fears God. He obeys his commandments, not following his own ways of kind of man making money his God and Lord. No, he makes God his Lord. He lives for him. He's not allowing his desires around money to be shaped uh, by his own selfish thinking, but by, by God's grace and God's kindness, knowing that if he doesn't, there's a danger of tripping into loving money instead or serving money or being enslaved to it, which just leads to frustration for you. Leads to destruction for you and those around you. I, I want you to know, I've known a measure of this. When I was a, a younger man, I uh, found myself in just a troubled spot in my life. A couple of years where life was tough, emotionally, a bit, a bit of a, a depressive place, to be honest with you. Both uh, kind of spiritually, emotionally, but physically, it was a difficult spot I was in. And instead of crying out to God in those moments, instead of turning to him and saying, God, help me. In those moments, I decided that I would turn to money. I decided that money was my way out. And I grabbed hold of gambling with one hand, the lottery, and I grabbed hold of seeking money with employment with the other hand. And uh, neither satisfied and neither rescued me. No, neither gave anything but frustration and disappointment to me. Every Wednesday, every Saturday, watching my numbers not come up. I don't know what the odds are of winning nothing over two years, but I won absolutely zilch. And my pursuit of money in the other direction, again, was difficult. I just wasn't clever enough to make money. And it's just like, I just wasn't all I wanted to be to try and get out of it. And it both ways just fell and destroyed me. I, no, I praise God it did. Because actually, my numbers could have gone up. Could have come up. And for a time, that might have helped me and given me a false hope. Or I could have done better with my employment and my financial directory this way. But thankfully, that didn't come good either. Because I could have just moved to a place of pride or security that was without God. Thankfully, neither worked out. Instead, eventually, I had to humble myself and say, God, you alone. It's you I trust. It's you I fear, first and foremost. And as I did that, what happened? I began to be satisfied with life in a place of peace. Now, my situation was still difficult. But the way I could then walk out of that just transformed. And then what happened is God began to provide too. He could provide a way out of that situation as I turned and faced him. What situation are you in right now? 
Maybe it's a situation of your own making. Maybe you're just a victim of circumstance. But what is your hope in your way out of it? Is it God? Is he at the centre of it? Are you fearing him first or is your circumstance currently overwhelming you? Let me encourage you. There might be some repentance needed. You say, okay, God, this is where I am, but I choose to fear you. I choose to put you in the right place. I choose to get the right perspective. Because part of that perspective is the second P, that God is a provider. I know God wants us to thrive this year because I know God loves us. He loves you and he loves me. And he loves providing for us. We're doing a thing uh, this year as a church uh, called Bible Every Day. And if you go to weareemmanuel.com forward slash Bible, you can join in where each day we've got a daily reading. And uh, this week we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus spoke to a whole crowd of people on this very subject. He's talking to them saying, don't be anxious, don't be worried. Why? Because God loves you and God loves providing for you. God gives the uh, flowers of the field uh, their beauty. He gives the birds of the air everything they need to eat. How much more will he care for you? He loves you way more for, than, than them. Of course you're going to have food. Of course you're going to have clothing on your back. Of course you're going to have shelter over your head. Why? Because he loves you. He loves to provide for you. And we see that here in this psalm as well. It says here, wealth and riches are in his house. Our wealth and riches in his house because, he's, because, because of him, because of what he's done? No, they're there because God has given them to him. God loves to provide for those he loves. And he's faithful in the way that he does that. And sometimes, uh, maybe you have this view, or maybe uh, you've you heard other people think about this, that Christians aren't meant to have wealth. They're not meant to have money. Money somehow is dirty or wrong or evil. Maybe you've heard that verse in the Bible misquoted that, the, that, that money, um, money is the root of all evil. That's not what the verse says to me. It says, no, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself is not wrong. It's the love. It's when people take money and make that God. No, money itself is for us to enjoy. I like spending money. Let's just be really clear on this. I like buying clothes. I like going on holiday. That's okay. God likes those things. I'm his child. When I enjoy the things I buy, when I enjoy the holiday, go on, experience that kind of stuff, God's not like, well, stop having that fun, please. No, he loves me. He is the inventor of fun and entertainment and joy. When we have those things, then he's like, great. When those things become God, no, sometimes holidays can become a God, can't they? Fashion can become, can become a God. Money can become a God. When we replace God with those things, well, then that becomes an issue. But when we love God and enjoy what he's given us, we're in a good place. Do you enjoy what God has given you? Wealth is not wrong. You don't need to be guilty about being wealthy. Maybe many in this room who are struggling for money, there may be many in the room who also are very wealthy. You know what? It is okay to be wealthy here at Emmanuel. We are not going to wag our fingers at you and say, well, let's have some of that, please. Thank you very much. Guess we clear. I want you to give it away because it's a joyful thing, but not because you feel guilty. No, enjoy what God has given you. When I was growing up, when I was a teenager, I lived in a very affluent area and uh, I had dreadlocks then. And uh, just going to let you get over that. And... Uh, I had some weird ideas about society and how it should be run. And I looked down upon the poor, uh, secretly jealous, but looking down upon them nevertheless. And there was one particular family who had a big house, several cars, and a few of my mates, uh, you know, the son and daughter were, were my age, and they're always well turned down, had the latest stuff, that kind of stuff. And I was just, I was just a bit down on it. And I quite happily tell anyone that they shouldn't have that money. They shouldn't have that wealth. They shouldn't have the material stuff that they did. And uh, someone picked me up on it one time. And they just put me in my place. I can't remember who it was. I think it was either my dad, maybe, or a youth leader. And they said, Stephen, you know nothing about their life. You know nothing about their hearts. You have no idea of what they've given away. They may have kept a smaller percentage than they've given away. You just don't know that. And there you are, just judging away. And, and I think they probably picked out the fact that it's probably just jealous anyway. So you just don't know what's in people's hearts. God often gives wealth to those people who steward it well and give it generously. When you look at people's lives, you think, actually, they're doing well. It may be because, actually, they're doing well with God. And God's decided to give to them. God chooses what to give to what people. God may choose to give you very little your whole life. And he's going to teach you how to be content with it. 
God may choose to give you huge riches. Again, learning to be content with it. The reality is the more money you have, as big as small, that famous philosopher tell you, more problems. More money, more problems. It's true. It's real. There's greater temptations with the more money you have. Working out what to do with it. Making sure it doesn't become a God. doesn't become a trap for you. If you've got money, it's very hard to enter the kingdom of God. It's not impossible by any means. But it's more difficult because the temptation to become self-sufficient and have it all together without needing a saviour. So we have to pray for those with wealth. We have to pass those with wealth. You know, as a pastor here at this church, it's my privilege to help those who are poor and having struggles with their finances. It's also my privilege to pray with those who are facing big decisions around massive investments or big business deals are going to work out. They need prayer and wisdom. Those are precious. Often meaning they've got to take, looking after employees and other people's livelihoods. There's pressures there. We want to help people who've got wealth. Mustn't be ashamed of it. I was speaking to another person who recently got upset with someone else because they'd they'd asked them not to tell anyone that they had two houses in Brighton. And uh, this person had mentioned it to someone else. And they were quite cross about it. I was just helping them just smooth it out. I said, hey guys, is it really that big a deal? And I said to the the guy who who had the two houses, I said, why is it such a big deal? I said, well, I told him not to say anything. So well, I get, I get that, but you're really, really quite upset about it. Why is it so upsetting? Why is it such a problem that people know you've got two houses, one you live in and one you rent out? So I don't want people to know I'm rich. I don't want people to think I've got money and that kind of stuff. I'm like, it is okay for you to have money. You and your wife, you've worked hard, you invested well, and you're, you're kind of looking to the future and how you can steward your money. That is okay thing to do. No one's accusing you of being selfish or greedy. Let me tell you, I'm happy to tell you if you are, but I don't see that in your life. Don't be fearful. And let's not wag our fingers at other people who are. We're, we're in different circumstances. We're to love each other in those circumstances, recognising that God's in it. If you know lack, if you're not loving, loving God's provision, maybe the verse in James will speak to you. To you. you do not have because you do not ask. God is inviting us to ask him for what we need. You know what? Even what we want. Now, he said, don't not be selfish ambition, not selfish desire. But when you've got God in the centre, when that's your beginning perspective, then you begin to ask God, say, God, I want to do this in my life. I'm not sure it lines up with you, but if it is, give it to me that I can do it. Begin to ask if you're lacking in some way. Um, when I was, uh, we've got some interns here. If you are an intern at Emmanuel, would you stand to your feet? Where's that? Where's that? It's Emmanuel. Yeah, woo! You can just stay standing for a sec. These guys are wonderful guys. These guys have given up a year of their... That's over there. there. Hi, student interns. Uh, These guys have given up a year of their working life to come and work for the church for free. They've done that because they believe in the mission and vision of this church. They say, hey, we're going to park some of our own life priorities for a while while we do this. They're not doing it because they didn't have any other plans. They're thinking, no, God, what do you want to do? And they're saying, they're doing this. They don't get paid for this. So uh, please buy them a pint at some point. Great, you guys can sit down. I was once an intern at this church quite a long time ago now and I didn't get paid and didn't have much money and uh, at the time I was kind of dressing like a skater I couldn't skate but definitely buying into the fashion of it and uh, as part of that you know looking a bit scruffy had some scruffy shoes my shoes got to the point where the sole and the main part of the shoe had started flapping apart and a dear lady in the church came up to me and said Stephen your scruffiness has gone a bit far let's talk about this can I buy you a pair of shoes I said Sure, that would be very kind. Thank you so much. And she's like, how much do you need? And so I was like, very gracious. Like, oh, 20 quid, something like that. And she's like, no, it wasn't that long ago. And so she, she's like, no, my, my teenage sons, they would spend 50 quid on a pair of shoes at least. Let me give you 50 quid. I was like, oh, that's very kind of you. She said, I'll get my husband to write a cheque and drop it into the church offices where you're an intern. Thank you so much. So sure enough, that was on the Sunday, on the Tuesday when I got into the offices. Sure enough, on my desk, there's an envelope. I was like, oh, cha-ching. Check. And so I opened up the check and inside was the 50 quid check. But it wasn't just 50 quid. It was 50 with two zeros on the end. That was a check for five grand. I was like, that's a lot of shoes. <laughs> and so uh, I, go and, I go and speak to the, the, this family and say, guys, I just can't believe this. this is so amazing. Thank you so much. How generous. Why have you done this? And, then, and, and the husband just shared with me and said, look, I've, I've been praying for you and your wife. And uh, my wife was due a baby at the time. We were, we're always, always due a baby. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we just thought of you and wanted to bless you, wanted to give you some money. So my wife came home saying she'd offered you 50 quid for a pair of trainers. She just thought, hey, God, what is it we should actually give them? 
And I was just like, I was just blown away that God would be so kind to us in, in that place. And so I rang my wife, said, hey, babe, guess what? <laughs> Take a seat, shopping spree. And uh, I said, we got given five grand. She's like, of course we have. I was like, what? She's like, we prayed for four, five grand. I was like, what? She says, yeah, yeah. You remember a few Saturdays ago, we're sitting down, we're praying about our financial situation and we're doing okay. God is taking care of us. But Emma had a four and a half grand's worth of student loan left over. And we could almost just ignore it. You know, you don't have to pay it off or take it forever. At some point, we'll get around to paying it off. It doesn't really matter. But we just felt like, actually, we don't want anything. We want a zero balance. We don't owe anything, want anything. And God, you're taking care of us, but we want to have no debt as well. God, would you please pay off our four and a half grand debt? And as a prime, we're also, oh, yeah, but our friends also need 350 quid for other things. Hey, let's that, slap that into the, the, the prayer as well. God, we've got 4,850 pounds. I'll tell you what, round it up. God, give us five grand. So we just prayed this for like 15 minutes, like not a long time. Just God, would you give this to us? Would you give us the five grand? And God did. And God's not, I, 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 should, I should pray for five grand more often, let's be fair. <laughs> But that's not always done that. But in that time, we just laid our request before God and God, sure enough, he answered it. So, so we didn't pay off the student debt, give the money away. We just went shopping. No, no, no. We paid off the student debt. We gave 350 quid away and we spent 150 quid on shoes. What's your current need? In the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that we've been looking at even this last week, it says, give us today our daily bread. Are you laying your daily need before God? I have to confess, when I have a financial need, my first response is this. That's generally what it is. That's not what it should be. It shouldn't be touching and groaning. It should be, God, you see my need. You promise to provide. I lay it before you. That's what our uh, kind of way, if you want to thrive this year, that's the way we need to respond. Next P for you. Peaceful. If you know God is your provider, you can be peaceful like the guy in the psalm is peaceful. He says this, light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is uh, firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid. As Christians, we are provided for, but it doesn't mean we're always wealthy. It doesn't mean things are always going to be easy. Jesus is very clear with his followers that in this world, you will have trouble. This world is still cursed. This world is still difficult. It is still troubled. It still is bad news. There are still times when it is dark, when the storm clouds of trouble roll in. But Jesus promises to be with us throughout it all, to never leave us, never for, to forsake us. And he will bring trouble to an end. And that's God's way. As you start reading through the Bible, you discover this is God's pattern time and time again. Things get dark, but God brings the light. Things get dark again, God brings the light. We see us, see us best at the cross, where Jesus, the promise of salvation, the one who brought, was remembering hope, and deliverance for the people of God. He's the looking at this is Jesus. He's so amazing. But it's like he's captured, arrested, tortured, put on the cross, and then he dies. He's dead. His life is cold. He's buried in a dark tomb. The stone is rolled over it. Bad news. I'm talking about bad news. That is bad news for those disciples. It's the end. What has happened? But, as in this psalm, Light comes. Easter morning, the dawn comes. The stone is rolled away. The grave clothes are folded up. Jesus is alive. Proving that there is hope. The end of suffering is coming. End of sin is coming. That we can know deliverance for all our sins. That we can know hope of being reunited with, reunited with God forever and ever and ever. That we can know an end to suffering we can know an end to poverty. You may find yourself right now in a dark patch for whatever reason. It may be dark because of your financial situation. Again, maybe of your own making. There's times when I have made poor choices financially. It's left us with a, a left us a bit tight or left us with a bit of debt. And maybe you're a victim of just the circumstance you're in. You can turn to God and not be afraid of that bad news. Your heart can be steady like this man's heart was steady. Why? Because he knows who his God is. He knows his God is a deliverer. And he may not deliver us tomorrow. He may not deliver us in a month's time. It might be years down the line, but God will bring deliverance. Last year, we had um, a whole season of uh, upping our giving, calling our Level Up series at the end of the summer. 
And as a family, we did that. Having already give, kind of up to our giving early in the year, we did it again in the summer as we encouraged the whole church to do it. But it meant that the summer and the, and the months into the autumn term, they were tight. They were difficult. And my daily plea was like, God, you've seen what we've given. We're stewarding this wisely and faithfully, trusting that you will provide all we need. And I just had to hang in there, just to persevere. It'd be so tempting to just put some more stuff on the credit card. Really tempting to maybe just level down again and just think, okay, well, let's just claw back some things. And I say, no, God, you've led us this way. Help us now stay the course. Trust that you'll come through. And sure enough, in November, God came through. Someone, friend of a friend, really just said, hey, we're just praying for you. And I just transferred some money to our bank account. Just eased it. Eased our personal finances and even allowed me to go on a holiday with my, uh, my 13-year-old son. It's like, God, you're so good to us. You know that. But there is a sense having to wait. So no, God, I'm going to wait for you to deliver. I don't want to look to other things to deliver me. I'm going to let you deliver me. So we had another friend this week who seven years ago felt God telling him to leave his business that he was a part of, his employee of. And uh, re- a really hard decision, taking him out of kind of comfort and uh, almost in one sense seems a bit uh, foolish. Like, is this really the right decision to make? But just believing God, no, he gave me faith for this. Walking out of it, believing that God's calling him to start his own business where he can provide for others, employ for others and pursue different avenues of work. And uh, if you spoke to him, uh, that was seven years ago, it was like six years ago, he'd say, yep, I've done that and it's pretty dark right now. It's pretty difficult. Suppose him five years ago, he'd say the same. But he said, but I'm trusting God, God's promise. Four years ago, the same. Three years ago, two years ago. And then about 18 months ago, suddenly it shifted. Suddenly it began to come good. Things started to line up and opportunities started opening up. And I saw him this week, I said, how is business going? He's like, oh, we're just about to open some offices, take on some more stuff. And he said, you know what? I'm just so pleased that God's taken me. I wouldn't have chosen this way. I wouldn't have chosen to take us long. My time scales are often very different to God, but I'm so pleased he has. He's taught me so much in prayer, taught me so much in persevering. What's a tough situation you're right in, right in right now? Are you just wishing it away? Are you learning to persevere, learning to pray? Are you turning elsewhere for your deliverance or are you turning to God? Letting him be your peace. You don't need to be afraid. What, what can really happen to you in this life? God has you and loves you, promises to deliver you. It might be this week. It might be this year. It might be next year. Who knows? But God promises. And in the meantime, we'll walk through with you so that your heart can be steady. You can stand upon him, your firm and sure foundation. You don't need just to survive this year. You can still thrive. You can still know great joy, great peace. You can still be generous in the midst of the situation you're in. Practically, last couple of P's quickly. Next one is being proactive. It says here, kind of, uh, uh, kind of implies all the way through that this guy's in charge of what he's doing with his money. But there's this little phrase, he conducts his affairs. If you were at our Christmas concerts, uh, you would have seen Brittany uh, as part of our kind of worship team here, giving it large with the vocal group conducting them. She's giving it like all this. Do you know what I mean? Sing louder, smile more, shut up, all that kind of stuff. And uh, keeping them in time. She did a great job. Fantastic to watching her. But she was in charge of that vocal group. She was telling them what to do, when to do it. We're to do the same with our affairs and to do the same with our money. We're to conduct our, our, our money. We're to say where it goes. Now, obviously, there are demands on us, but we are to steward things well. God has given us things, and he said we are to steward it. And for those of us who are given lots, we're to steward it even better, because much to those who are much is given, much is expected. We're to do right with it. Do you currently know where your money goes? Do you even have a budget? Now, some people maybe love their spreadsheets, love their different finance apps. That's great. But lots of us don't. Lots of us don't really think about it. Just go from week to week, just chasing our tail, get to the end of the month and doesn't quite always meet, that kind of stuff. That's not the way that God's called us to live. He's called us to live responsibly. It might sound boring, but sound boring. it's not. Knowing where your money goes means that you get to choose what to do with it. I am, um, when I started university, I was just coming back to God and I had a few hangers over for some lifestyle choices from when I wasn't walking with Jesus. And one of them was that I smoked. And eventually, I gave up smoking my first term of university. Not because I love Jesus. Not because I love Jesus, although I did. Uh, not because um, it was bad for my body, although that is true as well. But because I started recording everything I was spending. 
And uh, I write down literally every day, what have I spent today? And uh, I realized how much of it literally was going up in smoke. I was like, what? I want to spend that on beer. I'm like, what's going on? Just joking. I know, but I just saying, I don't want to spend it on just <laughs> trivial things like this. That's just rubbish. And I want money for decent things. I want to give more to the church. I want to give more to the things I'm really investing in. But I can't do that if I'm sending it elsewhere. Do you know where your money goes day to day, week by week, month by month? Have you got a budget? And here at Emmanuel, we are really practical. We're really clear about this. I want to help people in this area. So over the next year, we're going to be launching a new Thrive small group. In fact, lots of small groups with all areas of life, looking at things like marriage and parenting and work and theology and yes, money as well. And the first, the first Thrive small group for money is going to run in our summer term. Not this term, but in the summer term. And that's really just to help us apply some of the sermon's material today into your personal finances. Uh, we've been piloting this Thrive course over the last year. Lots of us the elders and wives have done it and found it really helpful. For me and my wife, we had some plans. We're thinking maybe in five to ten years we will do this. But as we sat down, took on wisdom from the Bible, as well as some of the really helpful stuff that's just out there in the world, uh, putting those th- two things together, we realized, actually, we could do some of that stuff sooner if we just switch some stuff around. So we're going to go for some stuff in 2019. We want to be ambitious with some of the plans and purposes that we believe that God's called us to. So for everyone who's a member of Emmanuel, this material is designed to be practical, down-to-earth, thought-provoking, biblically grounded, and help you steward your money more effectively. So if you're up for that, you can register your interest now by going to the website on the screen, wearemmanuel.com forward slash money. And this is for everyone. You know, you you might be in financial difficulty. Hey, this is for you. You may be rolling in money. This is for you. This is about doing that. It's about conducting your affairs well before God. Doing the things he's called you to do with resources that he has given you. Let's get involved with that. Now just a little practical note. Share where you're at with other people as well. We can be so English about it if you're English and we don't talk about money very much. Uh, but, you know, it's good to say, hey, you know, it might be in general terms. We're saying, hey, give me some advice on this. How do you budget? What app do you use? All that kind of stuff. Let's, let's, be, let's help each other. Fifth P, philanthropic. I worked quite hard to find this P. And uh, philanthropic just means uh, finding good causes in which to be generous towards. And uh, we see this in, this in in this passage, that the person who thrives in money is someone who gives generously and freely to the poor. He's one who's able to be generous and free. When you have the right perspective, when you know God is your provider, when you have peace in your heart and when you're conducting your affairs well, what does it result in? It results in you being able to be ambitious with your giving. I say, you know what? I can be free with giving away because I'm not concerned about my lack. I'm going to be free to give away because I've got some left over because I've stewed it well. It's not going up in smoke or going wherever. No, no, I'm able to choose where it goes. And this is what God's like. If you read the psalm before this, this psalm describes kind of the generous man who's thriving with money. Psalm 111, the psalm before it, describes the God who thrives and is generous towards us. God, by his very nature, is general, generous and loves to bless. And he's calling us and made us in his image to do the same. Right at the beginning of the Bible, when uh, he calls Abraham to be his son and to, uh, and to kind of be the father of many nations, he says, I'm blessing you to be a blessing to others. <coughs> And that's the same promise right down through Abraham's family, which you are if you are a Christian here. That we are to be blessed, to be a blessing. We're not meant to be just a pool of blessing received from God. No, we're meant to be a river of it. Pouring in one end and pouring out others, to, out the other end towards others. We all want to be generous. Are you ambitious in that way? Me and my wife, when we're talking about finance, we're not talking about what we can spend, what we can do, what we can build. No, we're talking about what can we give away? Knowing that we get to image God in the way that we do that. Are you ambitious this year? Are you thriving in this way? Thinking, hey, what could I give? I love giving. I love doing it in secret as well. I love just leaving things, places for people to find. Thinking, huh, we did that. We got to do it with God. That's between us and God. That's fun. Are you having fun this year with God? Giving money to him and giving it to others as well. What is your dream and aspiration around finance? What does thriving look like for you? We can be hopeful for thriving this year because this is what Jesus wants for us. Not to live in poverty, not in anxiety, not scraping by, not having to be grabby and greedy, but to know the peace of God. Sleeping well at night, even if you've received bad news. Knowing that the God who is to be feared reigns on high, 
has promised to provide for your needs and is well able to bring the light of the day to your darkness. This is why he sent Jesus. So he would provide for our spiritual debt. Wherever your financial situation is, spiritually, all of us come into the world bankrupt. More than that, we have stored up a great debt. Every wrong thing we've ever thought, every wrong thing we've thought, said and done. It's offensive to God and it needs paying for a payment that you can never pay. And Jesus sent Jesus, not as the great debt collector. He didn't come to judge us in that way, but instead to receive the judgment, to pay the debt that none of us could ever pay. To give us the righteousness that we don't deserve, the love and the grace, the lavish peace and joy that comes unknown. That's what thriving really looks like. Let me encourage you, if you don't know Jesus yet, we would love to introduce you to him. And uh, Tom and Laura a bit later, they're going to talk about Alpha, and that's be a great next step for you, particularly if you don't know him. But all of us, we're called to thrive this year. I'm going to invite the band up. Just like, as I do that, I'd love us just to stand to our feet quietly. I'd love you just to consider right now, what does it mean for you to thrive this year? What does it mean just to start by laying your request before God? Just being real with him. Just saying, God, you might be just like, God, I have no idea where my finances are at. Oh my God, I'm too, all too aware. I've lost sleep over it even this week. I'm troubled by it. Or I'm making some bad decisions because it is. Why don't we just close our eyes where we are and uh, make us going to play very quietly in the background just for a moment while we just think upon that. And we just begin to just pray, God, I lay my life, lay my finances before you. Let's just do that together for a moment. Heavenly Father, thank you that you know the needs that we've put before you uh, this evening. And I thank you that we can be sure you've heard us and you love us and uh, you long to meet them. Uh, Lord God, it's not always in the time we want, not always in the the way we want, Lord God. We thank you that you do genuinely care about each of these things. We know that because you've met our greatest need. You met it in Jesus at the cross. Lord God, knowing our great spiritual bankruptcy, Lord God, you came and you've saved us and loved us and uh, not just brought us back to zero, Lord God, but then poured into our lives massive blessing. And Lord, we say we're thankful. Thank you that we can look ahead to this year with great hope and knowing that you're going to cause us to thrive. And I pray, help us not just do that individually, help us to do that well as a community, lifting each other up, looking for opportunities to bless one another, to spur one another on uh, as you've called us to do, Lord God. Amen.